So I want us to look at one verse of scripture in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. Galatians 4, 19. And I want to speak to you from this passage. Notice uh, what Paul is saying here to the church at Galatia and how he refers to them. He says, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Uh, we hear the words of the Apostle Paul who was a missionary evangelist who went to this region and preached the gospel and souls were saved and an infant church was born. He's writing to them sometime later because he's heard the news that they have been carried away into false teaching, false doctrine. And uh, he is trying in his in his instruction, he is addressing that error and instructing them and correcting them in it. As we come to verse 19, he pours his heart out to them and he says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Here we find his heart as it's revealed. We find this, this heart of a missionary evangelist, this heart of a pastor. As he refers to these Young believers, not because they're young in age, perhaps some of them were, but they were young in their faith. And he refers to them as my little children. He is as a father, having seen this church come into life, having seen a birth of a new church take place, those who had uh, been lost in their sin and their iniquity, born again. He said, I have travailed in birth with you. And now that this error has come, I continue to travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now we know again that Paul is speaking to the church at Galatia, but we also learn here that we can take this passage and certainly understand the, the imagery that Paul is, is using and, and understand that this verse can be a verse that we as parents and as a church, a verse that we apply to the lives of our children and to us as we seek to bring up our little children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. A couple of years ago, I preached this passage in our graduation and we've adopted it as a theme in our school. If you uh, see our, our ball teams or, or our kids in their gym uh, uniforms, we have 419 emblazoned on their uniform. Sometimes we go to places and we play games and they say, what's that mean? And we point them back to this passage. Galatians 419, we want to remind ourselves what the goal is. What's the goal of Christian education? What is the goal that a parent ought to have? It is to bring up their children until Christ be formed in them. And as a church, we need to stand with these couples, these families today, and pray with them and support them. And you as parents resolve to be faithful to bring up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord until Christ be formed in them. Well, as we look at this passage, we're going to learn something about raising up our little children. First of all, I want you to see this morning the pain. There's pain involved in this, isn't there? Paul said, my little children of whom I travail in birth again. Of course, he's referring in, in a picture, in an illustration to labor pains that a mother would experience as she brings her child into the world. And he's comparing that pain with the pain that he, as a missionary and evangelist and pastor, has experienced in nurturing this Galatian church and teaching them to become spiritually strong and mature. And this pain can also be the pain of a church and a Christian school or a family, a mom and a dad, as they experience the pains of parenting, bringing up your children. This pain is a, 
can be a physical pain. <laughs> it certainly is an emotional pain. And it is a spiritual pain. Now, Paul is expressing this term, my little children. He's expressing his tender affection, his love for the Galatian church. And because he loved them, their disobedience brought him pain. Because he loved them, he labored for them. He was willing to experience the pain. And because we love our children, we're willing to bear and experience this pain. That pain that a mother experiences in the delivery room, uh, though it is intense, that pain gives way to exuberant joy when that baby cries and when that mother holds that precious child in her arms. But the pain of bringing them up doesn't go away. It continues. And may God help us to deal with this pain. Now, what kind of pain are we talking about? Well, I think we're talking about the pain that we experience when we see that our kids are hurting. I remember the first time with our oldest that uh, somebody in her class, her little nursery class, was giving her a hard time. And she was crying. And I remember the pain of that. When our children hurt, we hurt. We don't like to see them falter. By the way, that pain doesn't go away when they're in the preschool or when they're in the elementary when they're in the high school or when they're adults. That pain never ends. When our kids are hurting, we're hurting. That's pain. It's a pain that we bear. We don't like to see them struggle. We don't like to see them deal with difficulty. We, 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 we want to save them and rescue them when it looks like things are going wrong. And most parents just simply want their children to be happy. We want them to be happy. And when they're not, it affects us. It's also painful to see them in sin and rebellion. You don't have to teach those precious little ones to say no. You don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't have to teach them, you know, if they want a toy, they just take it from their neighbor. You don't have to teach them that. They know that instinctively. Why? Because they're sinners. David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned into our own way. We're born with this sin condition, and sin manifests itself soon <clears throat> in our lives and in the lives of our young people. And so when we see their sin and rebellion, when we look into their beautiful little faces and they say, No. Or when as a teenager they roll their eyes and turn a deaf ear to our instruction as if they know more than we know. It hurts. It hurts to see them continue and persist in their rebellion and their selfishness. When they fail to see the consequences of their actions, we as parents can look ahead. We can see what's coming. They don't see it often. And yet they persist in their rebellion and... and Oh, how it hurts to see them when those consequences come. It's painful to enforce discipline upon our children and hold them accountable. The flesh gets weary, doesn't it? I mean, we just get tired of the struggle. Our emotions waver. We question our parenting decisions and we question what we've been taught and what we know is true from the Word of God because it's just easier to let things go. And our children, they, they are, as I said a moment ago, they're hardwired to become sinners because they are sinners, right? And they, they quickly develop the skills of manipulation and deception. They know how to phrase the story, couch the argument, twist the facts, conceal their own guilt, reveal everybody else's so that they can get empathy and sympathy from you and you believe their story. 
Nobody wants to be accountable these days. Nobody's ever wanted to be accountable, have they? Adam, where art thou? God said. Well, I heard your voice, and I was afraid, so I hid because I'm naked. How did you know you were naked? Well, the woman that you gave me, she ate the fruit and gave it to me. You see, it wasn't Adam's fault, was it? No, it was Eve's, but ultimately <laughs> that thou gave me, it was God's. You know, we're really good at that, aren't we? Shifting blame, not accepting responsibility. The first thing we do when we get in trouble is we want to point out everybody else who ought to be in trouble, and we don't want to deal with our own actions. And it's painful as parents to be the ones who enforce discipline and hold them accountable for their actions. But that is the calling that God has placed on your life as a parent, to enforce discipline, to hold your children accountable. And it's not always enjoyable. It's painful, but it's necessary. It's painful to bear the cost of training our children. It takes energy. It takes money. It takes time. We experience many sleepless nights and disappointing days. And we always get uncomfortable when our kids disapprove of us, don't we? And they know how to express it. When they disapprove of us, we have to be willing to pay that cost. We have to be willing to bear that difficulty. You see, if we want their approval more than God's approval, we got a problem, don't we? If we're more interested in making our children happy than making God happy, well, we have a problem. If we're unwilling to enter into the arena and bear the cost and, and endure the pain of enforcing the discipline, you see, you can't just totally disconnect and leave your children to do what they want to do. The Bible says uh, in Proverbs 29, 15, and by the way, just let me remind you, this is the word of God. The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You can't just disengage. Let them do what they want to do. Let them make their own decisions. They're not able to make their own decisions. You see, in their teenage years, their, their, their whole DNA is changing. Their brain is developing. You, you can't allow them to make decisions. It's, it's, it's unbelievable to see what's happening in our world, isn't it? To allow children to determine that they want to have a gender reassignment. And in case after case, what they have seen is that these children who have been uh, irreversibly harmed are later filled with regret. In the same way, when we allow our children to make decisions and we don't guide them in those decisions, we don't lead them in those decisions, oftentimes they will make a very damaging decision. You see, there's a great temptation, and the temptation is to avoid the pain. By the way, there's no epidural that you can take for this pain. You see, the temptation in avoiding the pain means no rules, no enforcement, no consequences. And whenever they get in trouble, we come to the rescue. It's easier to blame other people, isn't it? It's easier to question and undermine authority and criticize those who are in authority. And by the way, when you undermine the authorities in the lives of your children, let me, let me help you understand something. You're also undermining your own. You're also undermining that authority. And so the temptation to avoid the pain in the short run leads to greater pain and greater trouble in the long run because when we don't teach our children the truth, when we don't hold them accountable, when we don't enforce discipline, what we're producing is going to be a generation of adults who cannot cope. And that is already happening in our culture. And so may God help us to be willing to bear the pain. By the way, the truth is painful, isn't it? The Bible says, am I therefore, Paul said in Galatians 4, 16, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Paul's telling them the truth, and sometimes the truth is hard for people to hear. 
Sometimes we, we determine what we want to do and, and we don't consult with God and his word and, and, and we, don't, we don't really want to know the truth. We got it predetermined. I said at 830, I said, sometimes people don't want to come and talk to the pastor because they, they don't want to hear what he has to say. Now, I don't run your home. You are responsible to lead your home. But, but are you open to the truth? And do you want to hear the truth? And are you willing to live the truth? That's the question. And if you're not, how can you expect your children to be? You see, we're living in an upside-down world, aren't we? Isaiah said this, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's happening in our world, isn't it? To justify the iniquity of this age, the deceivers have borrowed our language and change the terminology and redefine everything and says and say now to us, if you're moral and good, you'll tolerate all kinds of sin. It's all been changed. It's all been twisted. It's all been distorted. Why? Because we live in a world that has set God aside. We've rejected the, cre the creator, excuse me. We've rejected the creator so that we can worship the creature. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, Romans chapter one. And God gave them up to vile affection and God gave them up to uncleanness and finally God gave them over to reprobate mind and we live in a world that is, that is reprobate. We have people protesting on college campuses in defense of Hamas. And if Hamas were in control, the very people who are protesting in favor of Hamas would be slaughtered by Hamas. You cannot reason with these people. And you have faculty members in these academic institutions who are defending the actions of these students. We're living in an upside down world and our children are growing up in this and we better be willing to bear the pain and teach them the truth of God's word. You know, the average Christian home spends less than 30 minutes a week discussing spiritual matters. Well, I took them to church and that didn't help them. Well, wait a minute, what's happening at home? I put them into Christian school and that certainly didn't. Well, what is happening at home? Studies reveal that up to 88% of young people raised in a Christian home, and I use that term loosely, will walk away from the church and its teachings by the time they've completed their first year of college. Why? Because these evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're deceiving an entire generation, and unless we're willing to bear the pain and put the truth in them, I mean to love them and to teach them, and to pray for them and to labor through the difficult days and to enforce the discipline and to hold them accountable and to lead them in the path that they may not want to go in, but it's the path that God has prescribed. As long as we are not willing to do those things, then we're going to continue to see our children fall away. So we have to be willing to bear the pain. We have to be willing to pay the cost are we committed to taking our children to the house of God on the Lord's day? Sunday is the Lord's day. Are we committed to seek God in prayer? Are we committed to do all that we can to ensure their protection and secure their spiritual prosperity? Is it too great a price for us to give up our, our comfort our convenience, our coffee money to provide an opportunity for our children to know God. This is, there's pain involved. Well, then we see the process involved. He said, my little children of whom I travail in birth, what's the next word? Again. And, and that, 
that tense of that verb doesn't mean just once. <laughs> no, it's continuous. In other words, you could, you could almost say it this way. Of whom I travail in birth again and again and again and again and again and again and again until Christ be formed in you. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. The process is long and arduous. But don't give up. Don't give up. You see, it takes consistent daily effort to train up our children in the way they should go. There will be good days and there will be da bad days. There will be days when we see progress and there will be days when we see it, what seemingly appears as if we're going backwards. But be consistent. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses wrote these words in Deuteronomy 6, 6, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. By the way, let me just say this. The law was prescribed to be taught at home. Parents have the responsibility to teach their children God's word. The church is here to help you, and the school is here to help you, but it is your responsibility. So teach your children the truth, and but you cannot teach your children the truth if the truth is not in your heart. In verse 6, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. In other words, you have to believe it. You have to know it's true. You must be passionate about it. You must stand on conviction. Amen. This is the word of God, and this is the way that we're going to order our family, and this is the way that we're going to live our lives. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Verse 7, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. He's saying in every area of life and every moment of life, bring every situation into the light of God's truth and see what God is doing and what God wants us to do and let's talk about the Lord. Let's seek the Lord. Let's seek his word. Let's pray for God to guide us. Let's teach our children that from an early age. You having trouble at school? You having trouble with your friends? What does the Bible say about that? You, you got somebody that, that, that you don't uh, want to obey? What does the Bible say about that? You, you called somebody a name. What does the Bible say about that? Bring God's word into the conversation. You're struggling, you're discouraged. What does God have to say about that? You see, that's what parents do. We point our children to God. Verse 9, And thou shalt write them upon, thy, upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. I, when I think about that, I think, okay, the word of God is written. It's, it's, it's printed and it's written and it's on the house. It's in the house. Let's fill our home with Scripture. You, you can hang something up on the wall if you wish, but let's get it in our hearts. Let's get it in our minds. Let's get it in our conversation. It's a process, and the job begins at home. We must teach our children to fear the Lord. That means to reverence God, to love God, and to obey God. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If we want our children to know truth, it starts with a fear and knowledge of God. You see, we're in a battle. We're not to be conformed to this culture. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, the Bible says, casting down imaginations. This is what the devil is working to do and the world is working to do, to put thoughts into our mind that are not true. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You say, well, I think it's okay to do this thing and this thing and this thing that the Bible teaches is wrong. And we have an entire generation of young people today who have redefined morality. Why? Because they've departed from the truth of God's word. They have imaginations and things that have exalted its, th those thoughts above the thoughts of God. 
In Colossians, the word of God says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of of the world, and not after Christ. You see, we're living in a world where, where, where people say, you don't need the Bible, you don't need that book. No, no, here's what you need. You need to get in step with the revolution that's going on today. You need to, you need to be a progressive. <laughs> we're not progressing. We're falling away. I mean, we have leaders. We have leaders who can't lead. We have educators who can't educate. We have students who can't learn. All the while, the moral fabric and foundation of our nation is crumbling before our very eyes. Paul said, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Trust the science, they tell us, right? Trust the science. The earth is billions of years old. It it, it is the result of a random explosion that happened in the universe. We can't tell you how it happened. We don't know what caused it, but it happened. And as a result, here you and I are today. You see, that's what happens when you remove God from the arena, isn't it? Trust the science. No, let's trust the son. The Bible says they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I mean, the more they seem to learn, the less they seem to know because they've departed from God. And our children are growing up in this world and we have responsibility to teach them the truth. Don't give up. Galatians says in Chapter 6 and verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. I think Paul maybe had himself in mind when he wrote that because he was weary. My little children of whom I travail in birth again. Are we really having to go back to this step again? Yes, you are, Paul. Oh, he said later, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You see, Isaiah told us that the word of God will not return void. And I want to tell you, moms and dads, don't be discouraged. Don't be disheartened. It might not look very promising at the moment, but if you'll be faithful and trust God, God will not fail. All the crops don't come up the same day and all the fruit doesn't ripen at the same rate. That child of yours is a soul that Christ died for and loves. They're all uniquely different. You say, well, I put them in a youth group and they're not, they're not doing too good. I, I, I take them to church and they just don't seem to be doing much better. I put them in a Christian school and my goodness, that didn't help anything. I want to tell you, keep up the work. Keep laboring, keep teaching, keep praying, keep leading, keep guiding, endure the pain and let the process play out. God said he will work in their life. Well, there's the pain, and then there's the process, and then finally there's the product. What's the product? Until Christ be formed in you. That ought to be the goal for us. You know, as parents, we develop goals for our kids. Our kids develop goals. You know, I I got a dream. This is what I want to do. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? As long as that dream is revealed in the light of God's truth. Not shaped by the world, by the way, but by the light of God's truth. What does God want for the life of my child? That's really the question I should be asking. That ought to be the prayer I'm praying. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, and I hope you'll write this verse down, Colossians 1 verses 9 through 12. It's a great prayer. And it would be a great model prayer for you and your, to use with your children and to pray for your children. Colossians 1 verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Well, that's the first thing we need to learn. We don't need to cease praying for our children. 
and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. What do we want to, uh, for our children? We want them to know the will of God. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy. We want them to know the will of God and we want them to walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. We ought to be more concerned about our children pleasing God than being pleased themselves. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. What a great prayer. You see, our prayer for our children ought to be this. God, may your will be done. May they be strengthened. May they walk in wisdom. May they walk in a way that pleases you. That ought to be our prayer. We ought to pray that our boys will become men of integrity and honor who understand their role in the home, in the church, and in society. Men who will love their wives as Christ loved the church. Men who will provide for their own house. You think the world's going to teach them that? Men who will be faithful Christians and members of a local New Testament church. That's the kind of men we need to raise. What kind of ladies do we need to raise? Girls who will be chaste and pure. Girls who will understand that God made them for a specific purpose, a very special purpose, that God has not demeaned the role of, woman, of women. The Bible doesn't demean the role of women, but we live in a culture that has demeaned the role of a woman, that has said to a woman, you have to be able to do what a man does or you're not of value. That is a lie from the devil. The, those who call themselves feminists are not promoting women. No. They're leading to chaos. They're telling women that they have to do what a man can do, but God didn't make them to do what a man can do. God made them to do what a woman can do, and only a woman can do it. Don't ever let anybody demean, demean and diminish your value as a woman. God has given you a special place of honor. You have more influence over the next generation if you'll just raise your children and teach them the truth of God's word, if you'll love them and guide the home, I want you to know that's the kind of girls we need to bring up. You see, we get all these goals in our mind. You know, we, we need a world-class academic education. Well, look what it's doing, how, how good it's doing up there in uh, the Ivy League. You want your kids participating in that? We need economic opportunities. Give us this day our daily bread. That's what God's word says. We can trust the Lord, right? Sure, we need to work. Sure, we need to be industrious. But we, we're looking to the Lord for our daily bread. Well, we need achievement in arts and athletics. Really, is that what we need? Is that gonna, is that gonna help us? I mean, I love to compete with the best of them. I, I can't compete with the best of them, but I'd love to. But those are dead-end roads. You see, Peter said, for all flesh is as grass. He's quoting Isaiah. And all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. <laughs> John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, this is everything the world has to offer us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see, if you want your children to abide forever, you better teach them to do the will of God. And the product is, is that as you continue to work and invest in their lives, as you continue to pray, and God continues to work, and God brings people, youth directors and pastors and Christian school teachers and other people, coaches and other people into their lives, sometimes good, sometimes not so good, God uses it all for good, right? To conform them to the image of Christ. It's a pain we have to be willing to endure. It's a process. And we must remain resolved in that process. And there is a product. 
that will be realized. My little children, as a church, we have responsibility to labor and teach the next generation the truth of God's word. As parents, you have responsibility. May God help us to fulfill it.